Finding Corey Island Escapes Book One by Caitlin Lynch Narrated by Catherine Bilson Chapter One The incredible heat surprised Olivia as she stepped off the plane and walked down the steps to the tarmac. It was just like being slapped in the face with a hot, wet towel. She broke out in a sweat almost instantly and considered pausing to take off the jacket to her pantsuit, but the terminal was just a few steps away and the promise of air conditioning beckoned. Shouldering her laptop bag, she made rapidly for the doors. Since she'd come in on a domestic flight from Sydney, she didn't have to clear international customs. After collecting her suitcase, she made her way to the greeting area and looked hopefully around. Almost everyone who'd been on the flight with her were tourists, and they were making their way to several tour group and resort signs being held up around the area. Olivia bit her lip, wondering if she should head for the brightly coloured sign proclaiming the legend Sunfish Island Resort, with the tourists going in that direction, or if there was a different protocol for newly arrived staff. Not seeing anyone holding up a sign with her name, she shrugged mentally and headed on over. A pretty Chinese girl holding the sign and a clipboard smiled at her, though the smile turned quizzical as she took in Olivia's designer pantsuit and high-heeled pumps, a far cry from the comfortable holiday wear the tourists sported. Hi, I'm Jill. Your name, please? Olivia Stratton. Jill glanced down automatically at her clipboard before her head snapped back up. Wait, you're the new marketing manager. I am, Olivia smiled. Welcome, it's lovely to meet you. Jill shoved her clipboard under her arm to pump Olivia's hand enthusiastically. Sorry we didn't have a specific sign for you. Well, we did, actually. Rosie was going to hold it, but it turns out that her boyfriend was the co-pilot on your flight, and it's turning around and going back to Sydney in an hour, so she went to try and see him for a few minutes. Olivia blinked at the sudden gush of information delivered in a broad Australian accent. She'd only been in the country for a week, and still struggled to pick up all the words when the locals talked quickly. She was pretty sure she'd gotten the gist, though, and nodded. That's all right. I hope she got some time with him. Jill rolled her eyes. Guy's a prick with a girl in every town. I keep trying to tell Rosie, but she's blinded by the whole airline pilot glamour thing. That's still a thing? Considering how much pilots get paid, yeah, Jill said with a wry twist of her lips. Here she is now. Olivia turned to see another young woman hurrying toward them. She was a little taller than Jill and about Olivia's height, brown-haired and very tanned. Her white teeth flashed in her brown face as she smiled. Hi, you must be Olivia. I'm Rosie, the staff manager at the resort. It's lovely to meet you. Charmed by the friendly, unaffected greetings from two women Olivia guessed were both around her own age of 29, Olivia smiled back at them. It's lovely to be here. So different from New York. She'd left home in chilly, dark October, when the city seemed shrouded in gloom as winter approached. Sydney had been quite a shock to the system, warm and bright, green with spring growth. North Queensland was hot and far more humid. When she'd looked out of the plane window as it came into land, the view had been all turquoise water and sand-rimmed tropical islands. I reckon, Jill said with a laugh in her voice, giving Rosie a glance Olivia couldn't interpret before she turned away to see to the tourists awaiting her attention. Jill's our guest relations manager, Rosie said, gesturing for Olivia to follow her. Grasping her suitcase handle, Olivia obeyed, and Rosie led her out of the terminal to a golf cart parked outside and helped her hoist her case into the back. We'd go on the bus with the others, but it's full. We've got a lot coming in off this flight. Rosie hopped into the driver's seat. So I borrowed this off a friend at the marina. Is that far from here? Olivia hung onto the side of the golf cart as Rosie mashed the accelerator pedal flat to the floor, and they took off at a surprisingly high speed. Not at all. Only a couple of minutes. Rosie zoomed past another golf cart, narrowly missing an oncoming minibus. Olivia gave up and shut her eyes. Oh, come on. You're used to New York traffic. My driving can't terrify you that much. Rosie snickered. You'd make a very good cab driver, Olivia agreed, cracking an eye open as they slowed. 
Seeing boat masts in front of them, she relaxed, realising they must be at the marina. Which is all I ever took in New York. Generally the subway is much faster anyway, so I mostly rode that. I think I'll take that as a backhanded compliment, Rosie snickered. Well, you can drive next time if I'm scaring you that much. Jill never lets me drive. I can see why, but I don't have a lot of choice. I've never learned to drive. Really? Rosie looked startled at that before casting her a cheeky grin. Well, technically you don't need a license to drive one of the resort golf carts. I won't tell if you don't. Olivia had to laugh at that, getting out of the cart. Is this the boat? She looked at the catamaran yacht they'd parked behind. No, no. This belongs to my friend. Thanks, Matt, Rosie yelled at the boat before heading around to the back of the cart to heft Olivia's suitcase out again. We're just going along there. Oh. Olivia felt quite foolish. Lovely though the catamaran was, and obviously valuable, it looked minuscule compared to the magnificent motor yacht at which Rosie had just pointed. Wow. The resort has three of those. We use them for airport transfer, inter-island transfer, and our own dive and snorkelling tours, Rosie informed her. They're brand new. The new owners bought them after they finished the refurbishment last year. Impressive, Olivia said, taking in the boat as they walked closer. Several million dollars, I'd say. No expense spared, Rosie agreed with a nod. Everything on Sunfish Island is like that. You'll see. But the island was run down for quite a few years before the new owners bought it and spent a fortune to do it up. Which is why you need me, Olivia nodded. She specialised in relaunching refurbished hotels. She'd originally applied for the job assuming she'd be based in New York, but the resort owners insisted she needed to be on site. They'd hired her on a full-year contract and paid all travel expenses, and accommodation was included. It was the job of a lifetime. That's right, Rosie nodded. Hey, Corey, get down here and help carry Olivia's suitcase. God, you're so bossy, a deep voice rumbled with a laugh, and Olivia looked up to see a tall figure silhouetted against the sun, standing on the boat's upper deck. She blinked, dazzled by the glare behind him. This is Corey Gillette, our activities manager, Rosie said as the man vaulted over the rail. He landed on the lower deck in front of them before walking down the short ramp, separating the boat from the dock. Corey, Olivia Stratton, our new marketing guru. Nice to meet you, he rumbled before bending and picking up her suitcase as though it weighed nothing. Olivia could only stare speechlessly as Corey turned and walked back onto the boat. He looked as though he'd just stepped off an advertising billboard. Tall, blonde and blue-eyed, he had a deep bronze tan and shoulders so broad they strained the seams of his polo shirt. Her gaze slid down his back involuntarily as he walked back up the ramp with her suitcase. Corey's ass in tight khaki shorts was so spectacular, she barely heard Rosie's. Come on, let's get aboard before the guests arrive. Mm -hmm. Olivia said somewhat incoherently, still staring, but Rosie promptly cut off her view as she headed up the ramp in front of Olivia. Still thoroughly distracted, and trying to peer around Rosie to get another look at that incredible back view, she followed Rosie up the ramp without watching her footing, which turned out to be an epically huge mistake. The ramp was made of a pierced steel grating, and with Olivia's first full step onto it, her spiked high heel went straight through and jammed. Thrown completely off balance, she teetered, clutched for a non-existent handrail, lost her balance completely, and toppled headfirst into the murky waters of the harbour. The last thing she heard before the surprisingly warm waters of the harbour closed over her head was Rosie's shriek of horror. She might never have learned to drive, but she had certainly learned to swim. After a brief panicky flail, she righted herself and kicked back up to the surface, clamping her lips tight and holding her breath. Her head broke the surface and she heard, not more shrieks of horror, but a deep guffaw of laughter. Corey was leaning off the boat, extending a tanned hand in her direction and absolutely laughing his ass off. Cheeks flaming, utterly humiliated, Olivia accepted the offered hand. It wasn't as though she had much choice after all. 
As far as she could see, she had no other way to get up to the boat. Despite his chortles, Corey pulled her up as easily as he'd carried her suitcase, his other hand hooking around her waist when he'd raised her high enough to lift her aboard and set her on her feet. Her bare feet. I think this is yours, he said through his laughter, bending down to pull her shoe out of the ramp and offer it to her. Those would Jimmy choose, Olivia said pathetically, accepting the shoe from his hand even as she mourned the loss of the other one, now no doubt sinking in the silt at the bottom of the harbour. Corey laughed so hard he had to sit down on the deck. You're such an asshole! Rosie was at least trying to suppress her giggles and making a fair job of it as she dealt a slap to the back of Corey's head. Are you all right, Olivia? She blew out her cheeks, looking down at her ruined $500 pantsuit, the single shoe nestled in her hand. And then she blinked. Oh, my God! My bag! You had a bag! Your laptop bag! Rosie stared at her in horror. They both peered down into the murky water. How deep is it? Olivia asked. About eight feet. Corey finally managed to suppress his laughter. And no, I am not diving down to look for it. Olivia shot him a fulminating glare. Don't put yourself out. I'll get it myself. Handing Rosie her shoe, stripping off her soaked suit jacket and tossing it aside, she dived neatly off the edge of the boat. Chapter Two Now that I didn't expect, Corey admitted, peering down after her. Do you think I should go in? I think she wouldn't have dived in if she wasn't quite confident she could do it, Rosie said thoughtfully. And frankly, I think you'd be better served here to pull her out again when she comes back up. Corey started counting under his breath, though, deciding that if Olivia hadn't surfaced after sixty seconds, he was going in after her. He'd reached fifty-four when her head broke the surface again. Did you get it? Rosie called. Gasping for breath, Olivia nodded, holding the strap up in triumph. Rosie grabbed the bag while Corey hauled Olivia out again. There was no need for that, he chided. Seriously, all your electronics will be wrecked already. I know that, she cast him a scornful look. All my data is backed up to the cloud anyway. I just didn't want to lose my passport. It'd be an absolute pain to get a new one. Taking the bag from Rosie, she opened the front flap and pulled out a small, flat purse that contained her passport, credit cards and some Australian cash. The money was plastic and would be perfectly usable once it dried out. The passport she was a little more concerned about, but it was worth trying to dry it out. The stamps and work visa were still readable, at least. Well, at least it'll be easier to get a replacement for a wrecked one than replace a lost one, Rosie said positively and Olivia cast her a grateful look. Plus, you've got about a thousand dollars there. I'd have dived into the harbour for that alone. Tell me you didn't drop your bag into the harbour and dive in after it, a laughing voice said behind them, and Olivia turned to see that Jill and her busload of guests had arrived. Nah, she got one of her snazzy heels caught in the ramp and took a header, Corey said, and it was more than evident that Jill wanted to fall about laughing as she pressed her lips together eyes glinting with mirth. Instead, she shook her head and turned back to escorting the guests aboard. They all got a guiding hand from Jill or the man who'd arrived with her, Olivia noticed a bit jealously. Letting a paying guest fall in the harbour would be bad for business, after all. A light tug at her wrist made her turn back to Rosie. It's a half-hour trip to the island. You'll be way more comfortable in dry clothes, Rosie pointed at her suitcase. There's only a tiny bathroom, but at least you can change. Grateful for the suggestion, Olivia nodded. She and Rosie retreated to the rear corner of the boat's main cabin while Corey and the other man pulled in the ramp and cast off the lines. Someone else must be upstairs driving the boat, Olivia surmised, as huge engines started up and they slid away from the dock. Another reason to be glad she decided to retrieve her bag, Olivia thought, as she dug out the key for her luggage lock and opened her suitcase. She had a sinking feeling in the pit of her stomach that absolutely everything she'd brought with her was far too glamorous. Though this was a five-star premium resort, 
even the guests were more casually dressed than the most casual outfit she owned. Wow, Rosie breathed in astonishment, staring into the case as Olivia took a couple of things off the top layer and set them aside. You have really nice clothes. Nobody in New York takes you seriously if you're not wearing a designer label, Olivia said with perfect honesty. I feel like I'm going to be very overdressed, though. She looked at Rosie's cotton shorts, tank top and rubber flip-flops. I don't even own a pair of shoes without high heels. That made Rosie laugh. You'll be better off barefoot. Almost all the paths on the island are sand. You'd sink in. Lightly fingering the hem of a silk Mossimo dress, she said tentatively, I have several spare pairs of thongs and lots of casual gear. We're about the same size. You're welcome to borrow anything you like. If I could maybe borrow one of these gorgeous dresses to wear to the staff Christmas party? The Mossimo dress probably cost more than Rosie's entire wardrobe, Olivia knew, but the friendly overture was too kind to ignore. You're on. But what are thongs? Because I don't think you mean what I understand by thongs. Rosie laughed and explained that thongs was Australian for flip-flops, as Olivia picked out the least dressy thing she could find, a Roberto Cavalli printed jersey dress. At least she had one pair of heels that weren't stilettos, she thought with relief, as she dug out her favourite cream linen wedges. Thank you, Kate Middleton, for making these a fashion statement. There was nothing really to be done for her hair. She looked like a drowned rat, and there were only paper towels to be found in the tiny bathroom. She washed her face and twisted her hair up into a wet knot atop her head. That would have to do. The light was too poor, and she had too little time to do a lot about her makeup, but at least she could get rid of the raccoon like circles under her eyes from her running eyeliner. Wow, Rosie breathed as Olivia returned a few minutes later. How did you do that? You look like a million bucks again. Olivia smiled, warmed by the other girl's open friendliness and kind words. Thanks, Rosie. I was feeling a bit like the swamp thing. Maybe the creature from the Black Lagoon, Corey sniped as he walked past. Rosie whacked at his legs and he evaded her hand with a laugh. Olivia glared at his retreating back. The guy might be gorgeous, but what an asshole. Don't mind Corey, he's a total troll, Rosie said, rolling her eyes. I think you're being insulting to trolls, Olivia quipped back and they laughed. Despite the disaster of her unplanned dip in the harbour, Olivia relaxed. At least she'd have one friend at Sunfish Island Resort, she thought, as Rosie leaned across her to point out the window and tell her that they were just about to round the southern tip of the island. Rosie held Olivia back until the guests had all disembarked. The other man took her suitcase with a friendly grin. Tell the porter to take it to 6B, please, Jack, Rosie told him. Sure thing. He gave Rosie a casual salute. And welcome to Sunfish, Olivia. At least everyone was very friendly, Olivia mused as she followed Rosie, who trailed after the last of the guests. Corey stood by the ramp, offering his hand to her in an exaggerated gesture, his blue eyes glinting with mirth. She debated giving him a shove into the water. It was a very, very tempting thought, and it was also petty and beneath her. She swallowed the impulse and took his hand, letting him steady her as she crossed the ramp. Thanks, she muttered grudgingly. You're welcome. And I'm sorry I wasn't there to help you before. Startled, her gaze flew up to meet his. He looked quite sincere, and his hand was warm and strong as he held on to her for just a moment longer than was necessary. Olivia Stratton, a voice said thankfully obviating her need to think of something to say to Corey's unexpected remark. She let go of his hand and turned to see a handsome man in what she guessed was his early forties and actually wearing a business suit, albeit with an open-necked shirt and no tie. It's good to meet you. I'm Luke Collier, the resort general manager. He took in her dripping hair with a curious glance, but said nothing about it as he offered his hand for a friendly shake. It's very nice to meet you, Mr. Collier. They'd communicated by email after the resort owners had hired her, and his ideas and incisive manner had impressed Olivia. Luke, 
please. We're not formal here at Sunfish. She smiled in acknowledgement, following him along the shaded dock and into the hotel's main lobby. Wow. Olivia's head tipped up. The atrium was amazing, five stories high with a domed glass roof and live palms growing in gigantic stone pots. Water trickled from stunning fountains and ran underneath shining plate glass panels in the floor. There were fish in there, she realised, as one swam directly under her foot. It was hard to know where to put her eyes at any given moment. Pretty swish, huh? Luke gave her a knowing smile. It's very different to how it looked ten years ago, I can tell you. I was working here as assistant hotel manager at the time. Most of the photographs available online had been of the old resort, so Olivia knew what he meant. She shook her head in wonderment. The owners really did spare no expense. This whole building is new. Luke gestured upward at the glass dome. That even has cyclone shutters that can be closed over it. While we're required to evacuate all guests in the event of an oncoming cyclone, because the island may be inundated during a storm surge, the upper floors of this building would actually be quite safe, even under the most severe conditions. Impressive, Olivia said with a nod, wincing as a trickle of cool water ran down her neck from her soaked hair. Luke tilted his head at her curiously. Excuse me for asking, but why is your hair wet? She sighed and gave him a rueful smile. I may as well fess up. I'm sure it'll be all over the resort within the hour. I fell off the ramp when boarding the boat. You what? Luke looked startled. Entirely my own fault, I'm afraid. I was wearing spike heels and not looking where I was going. Luke was clearly making an effort to hold back his laughter. Olivia smiled at him cheekily. Go on, you might as well laugh. I've seen the funny side now, anyway. He permitted himself a few chortles before shaking his head. I wish I'd seen it, although I'm sure you're glad I didn't. Well, I was going to ask if you wanted the full tour, but all things considered, I think maybe we'll postpone it to tomorrow morning and let you get settled in today instead. I've got meetings this afternoon, I'm afraid. She smiled at him gratefully. I admit I'm eager to get to work, but I'm even more eager to have a proper shower and wash the ocean out of my hair. Then let's make that happen. Luke turned to the left and swiped an access card through a slot beside a door marked Staff Only. A short passageway led them outside and down a narrow path between high hedges. This leads to the senior staff accommodation, he told her. The cabins were actually part of the old resort. The owners decided to leave them for staff use when they built the new ones. You're in number six, which is a two-bedroom. You're sharing it with Susanna, our executive chef. She's very nice, but you probably won't see a lot of her. She's a workaholic. Olivia nodded, looking with pleasure at the rustic timber cabins set on low stumps as they came upon them. Each had a small covered veranda at the front with a couple of comfortable-looking sun loungers. A brass number was screwed to the front railing on every cabin. It wasn't long before they arrived at number six, and Luke fished in a pocket to pull out a key and an access card, both of which he handed to her. The card gets you into all the staff areas of the resort. These cabins don't have electronic access like the newer ones, so you'll need to hang on to the key. It fits both doors to your room, the one that exits onto the veranda and the one to the living area of the cabin. Don't forget to lock both, and don't leave valuables lying around in the common area because it's not secured. Anyone can walk in. Olivia nodded in understanding as Luke turned the door handle and opened the main cabin door. This is lovely, she said in pleased surprise, looking around the simply furnished room. It had a tiny kitchenette at the other end, a large squashy couch facing a decent-sized flat-screen TV, and a small dining table with four chairs. The floor was tiled, and everything was immaculately clean. Maid service will go over the room once a week, on whatever is housekeeping's quietest day that week. They can do your room and bathroom if you wish, but you need to let them in. Luke gestured to the door on the right-hand wall. That's your room. Her suitcase was already sitting by the door, Olivia noted. Thanks, she said gratefully. I'll leave you to it. Suze will be in the middle of lunch prep, so you won't meet her until this afternoon. 
I'll get someone to come by and show you around a little bit, take you to the staff dining area. All your meals are included, of course. Of course, she echoed with a small smile. She'd never had an all-inclusive job before, but then you couldn't actually pay for much on Sunfish apart from drinks, she recalled from reading the existing marketing literature. Feeding the staff was pretty much required when they couldn't easily source their own supplies. I'll see you later. Get settled in. Luke left her with a friendly nod. Olivia sighed a little in relief as she was finally left alone, and the tension dropped from her shoulders. The day had been a mess, right from the moment her cab driver in Sydney got a flat tyre on the way to the airport, and she'd nearly missed her flight. Rising tension and nerves about making a good impression had twisted a tight knot in her stomach, making her unable to eat or drink anything. Feeling an intense thirst, she crossed to the kitchenette to take a look in the fridge. She found several cans of soda, some of brands she didn't recognise. They had to belong to the unknown roommate. Biting her lip, Olivia eventually shrugged and grabbed a cola. She could always replace it later. Sipping on her purloined cola, she let herself into her room and dragged her suitcase in after her. The bedroom was just as pleasantly furnished as the shared living area, with a double bed, dressing table with large mirror, and to her surprised pleasure, a high-quality desk and office chair with a new-looking computer on the desk. It also had a generous-sized walk-in closet and a beautifully appointed ensuite bathroom. Delighted by her new living quarters, Olivia decided everything else could wait until she'd showered. The drapes over the sliding door to the veranda were already closed, so she closed her door, stripped, and headed for the ensuite. Chapter 3 Half an hour later, Olivia felt a good deal more human. She'd showered and washed her hair, put on the fluffy bathrobe she'd found hanging on the back of the bathroom door, and was now sorting through her suitcase rather despairingly, wondering what on earth she could wear. Everything she'd brought now looked far too formal, even though she'd selected the most casual items from her wardrobe before putting everything into storage back in New York. A light tap on the door leading out to the veranda made her look up. She could only make out a vague shape through the sheer curtain. Who is it? she called. Rosie! Smiling, Olivia went to let her new friend in, her smile widening even further as she saw the armload of clothes Rosie was carrying. Oh, you star! I was just wondering what to wear in order not to look completely overdressed. Rosie smiled shyly back at her, piling the clothes on the bed. I think you look great. Your clothes are just gorgeous. They are, Olivia agreed, and they're perfect for New York City life, or even Sydney, but here on Sunfish I'll just look, I don't know, like I think I'm better than everyone else. I want to fit in here, be part of this lovely staff family vibe you all seem to have going on. You will. Everyone's really nice and welcoming. And, well, to be honest, probably falling in the harbour really helped because now they all know a funny story about you, and it'll be a good icebreaker for you to get to know everyone. Olivia smiled wryly, choosing a pair of shorts and a flowered blouse from the pile Rosie had put down, and taking them to the bathroom to dress. And here I was, thinking I'd made a disastrous first impression, she called back. Well, Rosie looked at the laptop and tablet lying on a soggy towel on the desk. I mean, it was a disaster in some ways, but in others it could be a blessing in disguise. She looked up at Olivia as she returned from the bathroom. I've seen the funny side now, anyway. Olivia grinned back at her. When Luke said he wished he'd seen it, I got a mind's eye picture of how I must have looked and almost cracked up laughing on the spot. That's the spirit, Rosie said warmly. She took a pair of pink rubber flip-flops, thongs Olivia remembered, sternly telling herself not to snicker from the pile of clothes, and held them out. These ones are fairly new. Should last you a while. I'm only borrowing these until I have a chance to go back over to Hamilton Island and go shopping, Olivia told her, accepting the shoes. Oh, don't! Everything there is really expensive because it's all brought in for tourists. Take the other boat over to Airlie Beach on the mainland. That one goes every day too. The supermarket is only a five-minute walk from the marina, and there are plenty of other shops too. That's good to know, thanks. 
Olivia made a mental note to ask Luke which day she could do that. And how about doing laundry? I'll show you where the staff laundry is on the way to lunch. You ready? Olivia scooped her keys and access card off the desk. I am now. As they left the cabin, Rosie pointed to their right, away from the main resort building. I'm in the next cabin, by the way, number seven. Jill and I share it. Suze, your roomie, is a close friend. She often comes over and hangs out with us. You're welcome too, any time. Olivia nodded. Thank you, she said genuinely. The girls turned to walk back toward the main resort, and a deep voice stopped them in their tracks. Well, well, it's the little mermaid. How's tricks, Ariel? Corey leaned on the veranda rail of the cabin next to her own, a broad grin on his face. Remembering the way he'd apologised to her as she left the boat, and thinking of Rosie's advice to look at the whole incident as a blessing in disguise, Olivia flipped him the bird with an answering grin. Corey laughed, vaulted easily over the rail, and fell into step beside them. Good to see you can laugh about it. He smiled down at Olivia. She had to fight not to be knocked sideways from the impact of his good looks again, that, combined with an intoxicating, spicily masculine scent, as he stood close to her, made her head reel. I can laugh about it, but call me Ariel again and you won't be laughing, she said in a mock menacing tone, narrowing her eyes at him. Corey laughed again and nodded amiably. Stop being nice. You're making it very hard for me to keep my mind out of your pants, Olivia thought with an internal sigh and resolutely turned her eyes away from his chiselled, handsome features. She caught Rosie giving her a speculative look and did her best to smooth her face to neutrality. Corey's single, you know, Rosie murmured as they stood in line for the lunch buffet in the staff dining room. Corey had peeled off to go speak to someone else and was thankfully out of earshot. Oh? Olivia tried to keep her tone light and disinterested. Why? she had to ask. I mean... I know, and trust me, it's not like he doesn't get offers. Rosie gave her a conspiratorial grin. Every week there's a few tourists trying to throw themselves at him, but Corey's not the sort to have flings. She handed Olivia a plate. I've known him forever. We were in school together in Cairns as kids. That explained how comfortable the pair of them seemed. They really were childhood friends. Olivia did her best to divert the subject, though. You grew up in Cairns, so you're a North Queenslander. Spent my whole life on or near the reef, Rosie confirmed. I'd never want to be anywhere else. Hear, hear, Corey affirmed, rejoining them and collecting his own plate. It's beautiful one day, perfect the next, don't you know? He quoted the Queensland advertising slogan at Olivia. I haven't been here long enough to confirm the truth of that, she pointed out, but I'm looking forward to finding out. You'll see. Corey sounded utterly confident. Looking at both him and Rosie, incredibly healthy-looking, tanned, and practically glowing compared to her pasty pale self, Olivia could quite believe it. Although you'll need to use some pretty heavy-duty sunblock, Corey continued, or that lovely creamy skin will be lobster red. I bought a bottle in Sydney, Olivia agreed, and I'll get more when I go into Airlie Beach to shop. Rosie's been kind enough to lend me a few things, but I'll need to make a trip. Thought I recognised that blouse. Corey grinned at Rosie as the three of them left the buffet and headed over to a table. Looks better on Olivia, I'm afraid. Rosie made a face at him, but she also gave Olivia a sideways glance and a surreptitious nudge in the ribs. Olivia rolled her eyes in return. We are not thirteen, she hissed in Rosie's ear as another man paused by their table, distracting Corey briefly. Stop trying to matchmake. Rosie laughed but turned her attention to her food, which was well worth paying attention to, Olivia conceded. The buffet had a huge variety, everything beautifully presented and perfectly fresh. She scooped up a forkful of pasta salad and hummed with pleasure at the taste. The other man who'd stopped to speak to Corey took the fourth seat at their table then, and Olivia swallowed hastily as Corey introduced him. Olivia, this is Bryce, the resort's dive master. Bryce, meet Olivia. Bryce was younger than the other two. Olivia estimated him to be about 23 or 24. 
His dark hair was buzzed close to his scalp, and his deep bronze tan set off grass-green eyes. Involuntarily, Olivia wondered whether all Australian men were this attractive. Corey, Luke and Bryce, the three she'd met on Sunfish Island so far, were all good-looking enough to be models. Though if she were completely honest, Corey was the only one who'd sparked more in her than a mere aesthetic appreciation. She smiled at Bryce's cheerful greeting. Nice to meet you, too. So, when are you coming out for your first dive with me? Bryce asked. Olivia blinked, another forkful of food on her way to her mouth. Uh, what? No way can you effectively market this place without seeing its primary attraction, the reef. And you can't really see the reef without diving on it. Technically, she already made her first dive, Corey said, grinning and Olivia had absolutely no compunctions about kicking him in the shin under the table. Bryce frowned with confusion, and Olivia realised that news of her plunge hadn't reached him yet. Prudently moving his shins out of her reach, Corey promptly filled Bryce in. Olivia settled for glaring at him, though the way Corey described her had her inwardly glowing. Or maybe not so inwardly, considering the way Rosie was smirking at her. You should have seen her. She dived off the boat like an Olympic champion, Corey concluded. I half expected her to turn a double somersault on the way in. I'd give her a 9.9 for execution. She sure was a sight for sore eyes coming out, too. A little puzzled at that remark, Olivia frowned at him, at least until Rosie murmured in her ear. Your blouse went transparent. Corey got quite the eyeful. Olivia hoped the two men interpreted her flaming cheeks as being caused by Bryce's laughter. Picking up her water glass, she took a deep gulp. I dare say people will be telling stories of my arrival for years, she said, getting more exaggerated with each telling. It's a good enough story that we don't need to exaggerate, Corey grinned at her. She considered the position of his shins with a tilt of her head, making him chuckle. She picked a cherry tomato off her plate and flung it with deadly accuracy at his forehead instead. Now, now, children. Bryce caught the tomato as it bounced off Corey's skull. Settle down. You've got to work together. Quite, Olivia said. You've had your fun at my expense, she told Corey directly. Now can you just let it go, at least when I'm in earshot? Fair enough. He shrugged amiably. God knows I make an idiot of myself regularly enough that you'll soon have plenty of ammunition for return fire anyway. I can certainly attest to that, Rosie agreed. I have a million embarrassing stories about him from our school days I can share, if he keeps being obnoxious anyway. Corey's blue eyes widened comically. I'll behave, he said hurriedly. Olivia had to laugh at his schoolboyish dismay. You better... She pointed her fork at him. Yes, ma'am, he saluted her smartly. She didn't miss the warmth in his eyes as he looked back at her, a matching heat bloomed low in her belly. Pressing her knees together, Olivia looked away from those mesmerising blue eyes and prodded at her lunch with her fork. Strangely enough, she no longer felt hungry. Bryce and Rosie mercifully started talking, filling in the silence, and Olivia was content to just listen to their chatter. She glanced up at Corey through her lashes and found him pushing his food around his plate as well. He seemed to sense her eyes on him and looked up at her. Their gazes caught and held. She half expected him to make a quip or some sarcastic remark, but he just stared back at her, holding the fork still in his hand. For an endless moment they stared at each other, oblivious to the chatter and noise around them. This is a terrible idea, Olivia thought. I have to work with them. Corey smiled, the expression almost shy. Oh, fuck it. Terrible idea or not, I'm not going to live like a nun for the next twelve months. She smiled back. Shortly afterwards, Rosie said apologetically that she had work to do, and Bryce left to take a new diver's class in one of the resort pools. They headed off, leaving Olivia and Corey still staring at each other over the remains of their lunch. Do you have somewhere you need to be? Olivia asked finally. Not until 4.30. Um, 
Luke actually asked me if I'd show you around a bit, but if you'd rather someone else, I'm sure I can rustle someone up. Time to make the call, Olivia. I wouldn't rather anyone else. Corey's smile was slow and sure, warming through her. Good, he said softly. That's good. Come on, then. He offered a hand as she stood. Olivia debated taking it and decided she'd given the resort staff enough gossip for her first day. Besides, if she stepped a little closer, she could thread her hand through his arm instead and rest it on the pleasing bulge of his biceps. She got a few interested looks as she made her way out of the dining room on Corey's arm. A row of golf buggies was parked behind the resort. Corey handed her into the passenger seat of one before going around to the driver's side. Please tell me that you don't drive like Rosie, Olivia thought to say suddenly, grabbing the dash as Corey started the engine. He burst out laughing. I promise I don't drive like Rosie. She's a maniac. Never has passed her driver's test. She can't drive anywhere except here on, on Hamilton with the golf buggies, and she's banned from driving one here, too. That's a relief. Olivia took her hands off the dash before saying tentatively, I've never learned to drive. It wasn't really necessary living in New York. The subway goes everywhere. Maybe you could teach me? Sure, he said cheerfully. Want to start now? She laughed. No, let me figure out my way around from the passenger seat first. I don't think I can concentrate on trying to drive while gaping like the tourist I am. Gotcha. Well, if you're the tourist, let me play tour guide. Corey slowed the golf cart as the path they were on intersected with another. He looked left and right before turning left. First thing to note for when you do start driving, all our paths here are two-way and we drive on the left here in Oz. Noted, she agreed. What's that? She pointed off to the left at a small white building standing alone on a small rise. One of the wedding chapels. We have three and an average of just under two weddings a day here. We have facilities for a lot more, and that's part of what Luke wants you to push in the marketing, I know, that this is one of the best wedding destinations in Australia. I can see why, Olivia agreed, as Corey pulled the buggy off the path into a small parking area near the chapel. They got out and walked up to the small building. On closer inspection, she could see it was open on three sides, facing out over a small, palm-fringed cove. The white sand and blue water were a stunning backdrop. Wow, she breathed, taking in the surroundings. Just wow. Yeah. Corey placed his hands on the low railing at the side of the chapel, looking out over the water. I see this view every day, and I never get tired of it. I can imagine. Leaning into the railing as she stood beside him, Olivia gazed out at the ocean in wonder taking in the colours in the water as the depth changed. I've never seen anything like it. So many colours. Beautiful, Corey agreed, but he was looking down at her now, not out at the water. Lifting one hand from the railing, he gently brushed a strand of curly brown hair back behind her ear. I was knocked sideways when I saw you walking down the dock today, Olivia, he said quietly, and I feel like maybe you feel the same way a bit. She turned big, dark brown eyes up to his, but said nothing. He ploughed on stubbornly. Physical attraction is one thing, and I could put it to one side easily enough, but everything about you has hit me for six. The way you dived back in to find your passport, the way you put me in my place for laughing at you. This might be crazy because we have to work together, but I'm seriously attracted to you. And I'd like to make that clear now, before we even get started. I don't want there to be any misunderstandings. If you're not interested, or if you want me to keep my distance because we're work colleagues, I can respect that, but I need you to set a boundary here. Because I don't want there to be any boundaries. I feel like you've been giving me some signals, but I need to make sure I'm not misinterpreting you. He was being incredibly honest and direct laying his soul bare to her with the heartfelt words. Olivia took a deep breath. I think I might feel the same way. Except, what does hit for six mean? Corey's serious expression dissolved and he let out a hearty chuckle. 
It's a cricket term. Like hitting a home run in baseball. You do know that hitting a home run has another meaning altogether, right? I know. Slowly, giving her plenty of time to pull away, he put one arm around her, settling it lightly on her waist. We can take this as slow or as fast as you like, Olivia. She looked up at him and smiled coquettishly, turning to face him fully and lifting her hands to set them on his shoulders. Slow has never been my style. I'm really glad you said that, Corey murmured, arm tightening around her to draw her close. He sank his free hand into her curly hair to hold her head still as he bent to kiss her. Corey's mouth was hot and sweet-tasting as it moved over hers, gentle at first, at least until Olivia nipped his bottom lip. He let out a little growl at that and deepened the kiss, tongue sliding into her mouth possessively. She slid her fingers into his blonde hair and gripped, nails scraping at his scalp, going up on tiptoe to push her body firmly against his, crush her breasts against the hardness of his chest. They were both breathing raggedly when the kiss finally ended. Corey's hand shook as he brushed his knuckles over Olivia's cheek and traced a fingertip over her kiss-swollen lips. Neither of them spoke. Words would have ruined the moment, and they knew each other too little as yet to really know what to say. Instead, Corey dropped his hand from Olivia's face reluctantly as she took a step back. He smiled as she slipped her hand into his. Why don't you give me the rest of the tour? Chapter 4 Sunfish Island was bigger than Olivia had realised. She'd studied the official literature, of course, and looked at photos and maps on the internet, but there so much of it had to be seen in person to be appreciated. Every turn in the path seemed to bring a new stunning view, another delightful residence or grouping of cabins. This place is just incredible, she said, as Corey drove them into another part of the resort, where he pulled up within sight of a sparkling lagoon pool fringed with palm trees. Just, I mean, I knew it was beautiful from the photos, but photos just don't do it justice. That's where you come in. Corey hopped out of the golf cart and gestured her to follow as he headed over to the thatched roof bar beside the pool. I personally think we need TV advertising. Sunfish Island had a reputation here in Australia as a cheap family place to go, back in the 90s and early 2000s. There's almost nothing now that was even here back then. A cyclone eight years ago put paid to most of the old buildings. The cabins we live in are among the few survivors. I see. Olivia slipped onto a stool beside Corey at the bar and waited as the bartender made drinks for a couple of guests. So the existing reputation has it marketed to the wrong kind of clientele, because although Sunfish is family-friendly, it's five-star and certainly not cheap these days. Exactly. Plus, we need to get known outside of Australia. The Chinese, Japanese, Indian and Russian tourist market is huge these days, and they're prepared to pay for top quality. Hey, Corey. The conversation was interrupted by the bartender, a petite, beautiful young woman with dark brown skin and long braids. This is Olivia Nessa. She's our new marketing manager. Nessa is the best bartender on the island, Corey confided. Ahem. Beg your pardon, in Queensland. In Australia. Probably the world. Corey grinned and Nessa laughed. Better. Nice to meet you, Olivia. She leaned across the bar to shake hands. You're English, Olivia realised after hearing her accent. I certainly am. Been out here ten years and you'd have to drag me away kicking and screaming. She slid a coaster in front of each of them on the polished timber bar. What can I get you? I'm on duty later, so just a soda water for me, thanks, Corey said cheerfully. Like a beer, Olivia? Or a cocktail? She'd dearly love a cold beer and said so. Nessa set a bottle beaded with condensation on the counter beside a clean glass. One of our local lagers. Give it a try. One sip told Olivia that Nessa had made the right call. She took a long draught to soak up the parched feeling in her throat and sighed with pleasure. Lovely. Thank you. Welcome. Nessa gave her a bright smile and darted away to serve another customer who approached the bar, her long braids swinging. What's the policy regarding staff using the resort facilities? Olivia asked as Corey took a long drink of his soda water, 
his throat working as he swallowed. Perfectly fine as long as you don't drink alcohol while you're working and never inebriated on resort premises and don't prevent a customer from using the facility. So if it's busy, find somewhere else to go, basically. Corey shrugged. The resort is overstaffed and underoccupied at the moment, so it shouldn't be an issue. He lowered his voice. We don't pay for soft drinks on tap, and you only pay cost price on other drinks, so it's a really good deal. We're very well looked after here. He nodded towards Nessa, who was expertly making a cocktail. I prefer this bar because Nessa runs tabs for all of us on site. She's much more relaxed about it than the other bartenders. Plus, it's only a five-minute walk from the staff accommodation. It is? Olivia blinked, looking around. She'd gotten completely turned around on the tour, then. She could have sworn they were a long way from the main resort, but looking around now, she could just see the dome of the main building above the palm trees. Oh, I see. I'll show you the path later. This is the closest swimming pool to the cabins, too, and you can also swim at the beach down there, Corey pointed. It's safe. Beach swimming? Yes, it's really shallow up to about a hundred metres out, and this isn't stinger season. No sharks, either. You should wear reef shoes, though, because there can be sharp coral and stonefish, which you do not want to step on. Venomous? Yes. Spines on their backs. The pain is hideous, I'm told. Corey shuddered. We've never had anyone stung here, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't be careful. I shall consider myself properly cautioned, Olivia smiled at him. I did read up on Australia's wildlife before I accepted the job. And you weren't put off. Brave girl. They both chuckled. Tell me about you, Olivia. I know enough about Hunter Enterprises to know the bosses would have hired the best. So why was the best willing to give up what was clearly a very lucrative and respected position in New York and fly halfway around the world to spend a year here? Because love this place though I do, it has to feel like the back of beyond to a sophisticated city girl like you. His blue eyes were clear and calm as he watched her. Olivia took a deep breath, puffed her cheeks on the way out, and took another long sip of her beer. You're not starting with the easy questions, are you? She smiled to take the sting from her words. I guess we should start this off being honest with each other, though. Another long sip of beer and she looked away from his clear blue eyes, which seemed to see right into her soul. I had to get out. He only listened, doing his best to be quiet and really pay attention to not just her words, but the emotions behind them, as she continued. I'd been in the rat race since my teens, since my parents enrolled me in an exclusive Manhattan prep school. There was this intense pressure to be the best, the smartest, the most popular. Some girls couldn't handle it, they cracked, took drugs, slept around. I thrived on it. Twirling her beer bottle in her fingers, she said. I was always top of the pile. I was the one who got the internships, the scholarships, won the awards. Everything came so easily. Got picked up straight out of Stanford Business School to work at the top marketing firm in New York. Made associate in two years. Became the youngest partner in the firm's history on my 26th birthday. Corey said nothing, just watched as Olivia talked. Her voice had no real pride in it as she talked about her achievements. She might have been reciting a grocery list for all the emotion she showed. Her eyes flicked back to his. And with all the success came money, more of it than I really knew what to do with, and the perfect partner to share it all with. He'd wondered when that would come up. There was no way a woman as beautiful and successful as Olivia hadn't had men falling at her feet. Brad Cochran, or as my friends dubbed him after the breakup, the cockroach. She gave him a little half smile. One of Wall Street's finest. Wait a minute. Corey suddenly put two and two together. I know that name. Isn't he that guy who was recently convicted in the biggest money laundering case in history? For the Mexican drug cartels? Bingo. Olivia made finger guns and pointed them at him. As his fiancée, I was suspect number two. Took me months to clear my name. Most of my assets are still sequestered, and almost all of my legitimate clients suddenly really wanted to work with other partners at the firm. I was asked to take a leave of absence. 
and then the contents of my desk got delivered to my apartment in a UPS box. Jeez, Olivia, that must have been absolute hell, Corey said quietly. He couldn't even imagine what she'd gone through, her professional reputation ruined by something that had absolutely nothing to do with her, at the same time as her relationship collapsed under a tissue of lies. I'm so sorry. She drained the last of her beer and set the glass down on the bar. I sued for wrongful dismissal and lost. There was a clause in my contract about not bringing my good name into disrepute, and my name had been smeared all over the news in connection with Brad's. Even though I had nothing to do with his shit, I still lost everything. My job, my reputation, and after the lawsuit, there was no way any firm in New York would ever hire me again. All because I had the shitty taste to fall for a con artist. There was really nothing Corey could say. What had happened to Olivia was deeply unfair. She gave him a wan little smile. So you see, I really didn't have all that many options when John Hunter called me. I'd just pitched a marketing campaign for his California winery when all the shit went down. He liked it, called to take me up on it, and was seriously unhappy when he found out I wouldn't be able to handle the campaign after all. He asked me to handle it privately, which I did. I had no idea when or if I'd ever get another job at all, and the lawsuit had eaten most of my savings. The launch went off really well despite everything, and he offered me this job. The rest, as they say, is history. She shrugged, looking away at the ocean again. You know, I don't regret it. It was killing me slowly, the constant pressure to dress the part, be seen in all the right places, be friends with all the right people. This, she swept her hand around, indicating their peaceful surroundings. Maybe here I can find out who Olivia Stratton actually is when she's not under pressure to be perfect. Corey bit his lip on the remark that almost spilled from him. Olivia turned to him, her eyes dancing with mirth. Maybe that's why I feel so comfortable with you already. You definitely don't know perfect Olivia. I wasn't going to say it. His grin broke out, though. You did look like perfection walking down the dock. I was very intimidated. Until my clumsy ass fell in the harbour. She snickered, eyes alight. On impulse, he took her hand. Olivia Stratton is someone who can laugh at herself, and that's the first trait I look for in a woman, a good sense of humour. Laughing freely at that, Olivia squeezed his hand back. Well, a couple of months ago, I'm pretty sure I wouldn't have seen the funny side, but I definitely do now. Corey looked at his watch then and said with regret that he needed to get back. They waved to Nessa, who was just getting busy with the early evening cocktail hour and hopped back in the golf cart. He pointed out the walking path, which was a shortcut to the cabins, as they passed it. I have to go call the early evening bingo game, Corey said regretfully. It's our regular bingo caller's day off. Olivia laughed at the thought of Corey calling bingo numbers to a crowd of retirees. Because he was the activities director, she supposed he had to be able to cover for any of his team when required, though. Thinking that she needed to know more about the activities and events the resort offered, she questioned him about his job. Corey answered all her questions good-naturedly, clearly happy to talk about the job he obviously adored. Bryce was right when he said that you really need to see the reef, though, he said as he pulled the golf buggy back into the parking slot they'd taken it from. Have you ever dived before? She shook her head. Not proper diving with oxygen tanks, no. I'm a strong swimmer, though. That I already knew, he cast her a grin. Well, you'd have to take a couple of Bryce's starter lessons in the pool to begin with, but I'm taking a group out snorkelling tomorrow, if you'd be interested. I'd love to, Olivia said enthusiastically, before she thought to say. I don't know if Luke will want me to start work here, though. It's an early afternoon tour. You can catch up with him in the morning and see, Corey suggested. I'm pretty sure he'll tell you to take a few days and familiarise yourself with everything the resort has to offer before you consider implementing anything, though. That sounded like a sensible strategy. Well, provided he's OK with it, yes, I'd love to come snorkelling. Excellent. Boat leaves the dock at one. We've got plenty of snorkelling gear, but make sure you bring your own sunscreen. He grinned down at her, 
and as they approached the door leading back into the main building, he drew her gently to a stop with his hand on her elbow. There's nothing I'd like more than to spend the whole evening getting to know you, Olivia. I'm sorry I can't. Corey's eyes were serious as he looked down at her. She smiled back at him, charmed again by his honesty and his straightforward, open approach. I'd like that too. I'm honoured by your trust in telling me about your ex and why you're here, and I promise you that nobody will hear a word of it from me. She was already quite sure of that, but she nodded anyway, accepting his pledge. Corey bent his head slowly, allowing her time to move away if she wanted to, but she was more than happy to step in closer and accept the kiss he pressed against her lips. Tomorrow, he said, a low-voiced promise, before he swiped his access card and let them back into the building. Olivia was sure the colour flags were flying high on her cheeks as she watched Corey bound up the spiral stairs in the atrium to the main lounge on the second floor, where he had to call the bingo game. She caught herself admiring the muscles bunching in his strong thighs as he took the steps three at a time, and laughed at herself. Corey was a whole lot more than just a handsome face and an attractive body. He's good looking for sure, but Corey's a player, a voice said behind her, and Olivia turned to see Jill, the guest relations manager she'd met at the airport. Don't get your heart broken. Olivia wasn't entirely sure what made her ask. Is that personal experience talking? But the way Jill's face flushed told her that her shot in the dark was right on target. Jill didn't say another word, just turned and stalked away, outrage radiating from her in waves. I think I might have made an enemy, Olivia muttered regretfully. She couldn't do a lot about it, though. She guessed that the moment Jill so much as suspected chemistry between Olivia and Corey, her nose would have been out of joint. Thank God nobody had witnessed their kiss at the wedding chapel or the quick embrace outside the door. Olivia's name would have been mud all over Sunfish Island before nightfall. No doubt she'd have been smeared as a slut who threw herself at Corey literally as soon as she arrived. Wandering over to look at the tour booking desk, currently unoccupied, and the large display of brochures for available trips, Olivia wondered if she had been slutty. She'd always had a policy of never getting involved with anyone she worked with. What was it about Corey that had made her forget that resolution within a couple of hours of meeting him? It wasn't just the way he looked. She'd worked with attractive men many times before and never felt remotely tempted. No, she felt a genuine connection with Corey, one that had been there from their first meeting, and every moment spent in his company since had only reinforced the impression that he was a man she could like and respect, as well as lust after. I'm not going to feel guilty for going after what I want, Olivia decided, squaring her shoulders and turning to look around the lobby. Whatever had happened between Jill and Corey was obviously in the past, and Jill's little display of jealousy only put Olivia on her guard. She couldn't trust anything Jill said about Corey now. Every instinct told her that Corey wasn't a player, as Jill had described him, and wouldn't Rosie, who'd known Corey all her life, have dropped a gentle hint or two if he were, instead of eagerly matchmaking? Chapter 5 Just as Olivia thought of Rosie, she came through a door on the other side of the lobby with Luke, the pair of them talking earnestly. They both spotted her and smiled at the same moment, coming over to join her. Hey, how are you settling in? Luke asked cheerfully. Better after the dunking? His eyes twinkled. Much, thank you, Olivia said. Rosie was kind enough to lend me some of her things. I'm afraid I vastly overestimated the dress code here at Sunfish. I think I'll need to go into Early Beach to shop one day, if that can be arranged. Of course, the boat goes every day, Luke said with a shrug. You can go any time you like. As far as I'm concerned, you make your own schedule here, Olivia. The only instruction I have from Mr. Hunter is the time to see to it you have anything you need. Rosie mentioned your laptop and tablet took a dunking too. And my phone, she admitted. Yes, I'll need to purchase replacements for those in Early as well. The resort has an account at the computer and electrical store. Put them on our tab. Luke's tone brooked no argument. Well, thank you, she accepted gracefully, secretly grateful. Replacing her electronics would have put a serious dent in her much-depleted savings. That's very good of you. 
he waved away her thanks. There's a computer in your room, too, but that's mainly because I don't really have office space for you. You're welcome to work anywhere you like in the resort. Although you're on staff, you're not part of the guest relations side, and as such, I don't mind if you want to act more as a guest here to get the real guest experience than as a staff member. Startled, Olivia blinked at him. Thank you, but I want to pull my weight around here too. If you need an extra pair of hands at any time, please just say so. Rosie will let you know. Luke gestured at Rosie, who hadn't said a word as she nodded along in agreement with what he was saying. She's our staff manager. Well, there may be times when we do need extra pairs of hands, of course, Rosie said. But I'll try not to shove you into anything you wouldn't be prepared for. I mean, I'm guessing you're going to spend a fair bit of time talking to guests anyway, asking them what they think are the best things about Sunfish for marketing purposes, so guest relations would probably be a handy spot for you. Which is Jill's department, of course. Of course, Olivia echoed, doing her level best not to let her feelings at the idea of having to work for Jill, even temporarily, show on her face. She must have failed, though, because after dinner, eaten with Luke and Rosie, who both talked enthusiastically about how much they loved working at Sunfish, she was walking back to her cabin with Rosie when the other girl asked, Um, Olivia, I hope you don't mind me asking this, but have you had a run-in with Jill? She missed a step, recovered. I thought I wasn't that obvious. Jill has a way of rubbing people up the wrong way sometimes. One would think that guest relations wouldn't be the best career for her, then, Olivia said dryly. You'd be surprised the shit she has to deal with, Rosie replied. Guest relations manager is just a fancy title for troubleshooter. Hmm. They'd reached her cabin, and Olivia stopped and turned to Rosie with a sigh. I don't want to get off on the wrong foot, and I don't want to make any enemies, but I'm pretty sure Jill was predisposed to dislike me, from the moment Corey started flirting with me. She was predisposed to dislike you from the moment she saw you in the airport and realised how pretty you are, Rosie said bluntly. Because yes, as you've already figured out, Corey is a sore spot with Jill. Will you tell me about it? Olivia pleaded. I know Jill is your friend, and I don't want to ask you to go behind her back, but I'm pretty sure I can't trust anything she says about Corey and I'm pretty sure I can trust what you tell me about him, since you've known each other so long. Rosie sighed and glanced at the lit window in her cabin next door. Invite me in? Sure. They went into the lounge area and sat down. Rosie rubbed her hands together, looking as though she was thinking about what to say. Olivia waited in silence, not wanting to push. Jill and Rosie were obviously close, and she didn't want to force Rosie to betray her friend. Corey and Jill dated for a while when Jill got the job here in the middle of last year, Rosie said finally. It lasted maybe three or four months? I don't remember exactly. Why did they break up? I don't need all the gory details, Olivia said hurriedly. But who dumped who would be good to know? Corey ended it, but Jill drove him to it. She was incredibly clingy and possessive. I'm sure you can imagine that with the way Corey looks... He literally can't help girls throwing themselves at him sometimes. There was this guest at the resort. She was here with her parents. She wouldn't leave him alone. She was all of 17, so Corey just treated her like a kid with a crush, which was exactly the right thing to do. He was polite but didn't encourage her, and he made damn sure she couldn't catch him alone anywhere. Which didn't stop Jill from getting wildly jealous every time Corey even glanced in her direction. Rosie sighed and leaned back in her chair. Jill was being stupid. I told her so myself, told her Corey would never touch the girl. But she wouldn't listen, Olivia surmised. Yup, and in the end there was a really ugly scene where Jill confronted the girl and called her all sorts of demeaning names, told her to stay away from Corey. Honestly, I think the only reason Jill didn't get fired for it was that the parents thought their daughter had been making a fool of herself and took Jill's side when the matter went up before Luke. Olivia shook her head. That must have been pretty hard on the girl. Which was what Corey thought. The whole scene was just so unnecessary, 
and he told Jill that when he broke it off. She'd been jealous over nothing, and he could see it inevitably happening again, every time he even so much as spoke to a pretty girl. He didn't want the drama. And here I come with a history of nothing but drama, Olivia thought. Thanks for telling me this, Rosie. You're welcome. I'd like to see Corey happy. I'd like to see Jill happy, too, but the two of them just aren't suited for each other. Rosie shrugged, her irrepressible grin breaking out again. I'm a natural matchmaker. What about you? Anyone special in your life? Olivia asked curiously. A wistful look crossed Rosie's face briefly before she shook her head. I'm afraid not. That look tells me that there's someone, though. Didn't Jill say you were seeing a pilot? Olivia remembered the earlier conversation in the airport. Past tense, I'm afraid. I'm sorry to hear that, Olivia said genuinely. He was seeing multiple other girls. Rosie's smile was wry. And nice though he was, and honest about it, which was a big point in his favour, I'd like to be somebody's one and only. Don't we all, Olivia thought. Jill told me Corey was a player. Not in the least. Rosie shook her head vehemently. Couldn't be further from the truth. Corey isn't one to start something unless he thinks it's going somewhere. He was genuinely broken up about ending things with Jill, but her jealousy was just too much for the relationship to bear. So me even hinting that I might be jealous would be a big red flag, Olivia surmised. I'll keep that in mind. You should because there are silly young girls who try to throw themselves at him every other week here, and Corey will be watching to see your reaction, Rosie warned. She covered a huge yawn and laughed at herself. God, sorry. Been a long day. I'm going to go crash. Thank you for telling me the truth. You're welcome. Rosie surprised Olivia with a hug, which Olivia returned tentatively. Don't let Jill get to you. If I see or hear her starting any crap, I'll try and pull her up. She listens to me. Olivia thanked her again, and Rosie took her leave with a cheerful wave, leaving Olivia alone with her thoughts. Lost in thought, Olivia sat for a while in silence. She was startled when the cabin door opened and looked up to see a tall, red-headed woman, who was probably a couple of years her senior, entering. Hi, she said uncertainly. Hello, you must be Olivia. I have heard so much about you already. I'm Susanna, your roommate. Oh. Getting to her feet, Olivia smiled in welcome. Hi, nobody mentioned you were French. Susanna laughed throatily, stepping forward and kissing Olivia enthusiastically on both cheeks. Eh, we are a multinational crew here. Nobody thinks much of it. As long as they can understand your accent, that is. That made Olivia smile. She liked Susanna immediately, admiring her poise and confident air. I swiped one of your sodas from the fridge earlier, she confessed, figuring she'd best get that out of the way first. I'll replace it, I promise. Susanna waved it off with another laugh, heading to the fridge herself. Want another? I'm thirsty, been a busy night in the kitchen. Olivia accepted the offer and they sat to introduce themselves to each other properly. Susanna was more than happy to answer questions, talking about her training at Le Cordon Bleu in Paris and her past work in major hotels and famous restaurants. Olivia almost died of shock when Susanna admitted to once having worked for Gordon Ramsay and having a glowing recommendation from the infamously critical chef on her resume. Well, nothing I've ever done compares to that. You definitely win. Olivia said, very much impressed, making Susanna's throaty laugh ring out again. The French girl smothered a yawn then, admitting that she'd had a long day. Go sleep, we can talk more tomorrow. We've got plenty of time to get to know each other, Olivia insisted when Susanna demurred, offering to keep her company. Left alone, she thought she should probably go on into her own room, in case she made noise in the lounge area and kept the weary chef awake. At least the nightwear she'd brought was perfectly fine. She liked to be comfortable when she slept, so she just changed into a tank top and a pair of boy-leg cotton shorts before slipping into bed and turning out the bedside light. Sleep was nowhere to be found, though, 
and after a couple of hours tossing and turning, Olivia gave up. Getting out of bed, she went out onto her little veranda, sitting down on the chair and putting her feet up on the railing. It was blissfully cool outside now, whereas her room had been too warm. She sighed as the sea breeze washed over her and let her head tip back. Can't sleep either, a low voice said, and she startled upright, yelping with shock as her feet fell to the floor. Sorry. Who the hell is that? Olivia pressed her hand to her pounding heart. Corey. Remember, I live next door? There was a laugh in his voice. God damn it. She shut her eyes before opening them, laughing at herself and peering across the dark space between the two cabins. She could just about make him out in the dim moonlight, lying in... Is that a hammock? Sure is, and it's big enough to share. Want to come join me? She hesitated only briefly before scrambling to her feet and heading over. I've never been in a hammock before, she admitted, looking at Corey sprawled negligently in the net, one long leg hanging over the side. How do you get into it gracefully? Easier said than done, he chuckled, but actually fairly easy when you have help. He pushed at the floor with his foot, swung towards her and scooped her easily off her feet to lie with her back against his chest. Olivia flailed for a second before realising she was actually making it more likely that they'd both fall out and relaxed back against Corey. You could have warned me, she grumped. I could, but it wouldn't have been nearly as much fun. He nuzzled at her ear, making her shiver. Practical joker, she accused, but she couldn't repress the laughter in her voice and he knew it. It's a bad habit. He fell silent, and she did too, feeling oddly relaxed despite their intimately close position, despite having known him for barely twelve hours. Lying in the cradle of his thighs, head pillowed on his broad chest, Olivia felt more comfortable, more secure, than she had in a very long time. Than she could ever remember feeling, if she were completely honest with herself. Corey's toe brushing the floor pushed off, set them swinging gently. The slow side-to-side -side motion soothed Olivia, and her eyes drifted closed. Chapter 6 The previous day seemed dreamlike and unreal to Olivia when she woke to a bright, hot morning and Rosie knocking on her door. The other girl waited while she dressed, then accompanied her to breakfast, chattering about all the things Olivia should do on her first day. I'm going snorkelling later, Olivia cut Rosie off but I'd really like to just take a walk around the resort this morning. Find my way around properly, really get familiar with the place. Absolutely, Rosie nodded her approval. Reception has a good map of the island. Stop there and grab one before you go. And don't forget a hat and sunscreen. Olivia thanked Rosie for her advice, refraining from snapping that she already knew that. She hadn't seen Corey this morning, at his cabin or in the staff dining room, and butterflies were beginning to flutter in her stomach. What did she really know about Corey anyway? She'd met him less than a day ago, yet the previous night they'd got extremely hot and heavy together. Determined to forget about Corey for the time being and get to work, she grabbed one of the maps from reception and headed back to her cabin to put on sunscreen and find her hat and sunglasses. Ten minutes later she set off, a bag slung over her shoulder containing a bottle of water, a notebook and a pen. In the absence of being able to take photos and make notes on her phone as she normally did, the notebook would have to do. She kept a close eye on the time during her walk, mindful that she needed to get back to her cabin in time to change and then meet the boat at the dock at one. Lunch wasn't in her plan, since she had no desire to humiliate herself yet again in front of Corey by getting seasick on the boat. The transfer from Hamilton Island had been short enough yesterday that she hadn't worried about it, but bobbing about on a smaller boat for a couple of hours could well be a different story. Returning to her cabin with a stack of notes to consider, she swiped another of Susanna's sodas, thinking guiltily that she must find out where to buy more before finding her bikini. She'd brought three, sure there would be plenty of opportunity for swimming, but no swimming shirt. Chewing on her lip, she shrugged and grabbed one of Rosie's T-shirts, an elderly-looking one. Floating face down in the water for an hour or two, she was likely to end up with a burned back if she didn't cover up. 
she made sure to thickly cover every exposed inch of skin with the waterproof, high-factor sunscreen she'd bought in Sydney before putting her hat and flip-flops back on and heading for the dock. The boat was bigger than she'd expected, not one of the big, handsome cruisers that transferred tourists to and from the island, but a generously-sized motor yacht. Corey stood on the deck, talking to a couple of tourists who'd just boarded. Both were attractive young women, who stood close and gazed at him with undisguised admiration. Corey's eyes slid toward Olivia, and he smiled but made no effort to break off his conversation. She nodded at him in greeting and boarded the boat, walking past him and finding a seat on which to put her bag containing her towel and water bottle. She absolutely refused to show jealousy. Quite apart from the fact that it would put Corey off her completely, she was pretty sure she didn't have anything to worry about. Her decision was vindicated a couple of minutes later as Corey came over to greet her properly, an arm sliding around her waist as he bent to kiss her cheek and nuzzle lightly against her neck. Hello, beautiful. Hello yourself. Olivia wiggled as his fingers slid against her ribs and he found a ticklish spot. Laughing as she squeaked and danced away, Corey pulled her back closer and ducked beneath the brim of her hat to claim a proper kiss. His lips were warm and sweet. Olivia lost herself in the kiss briefly, in the slide of the heat of his body through the thin layers of their clothing as he pulled her close. A wolf whistle made them pull apart. Colour tinged Corey's cheeks as he made a face at the boat's driver. Put a sock in it, Jody. The driver was an older woman with darkly tanned skin and white teeth flashing in her laughing face. Corey introduced Olivia, telling her, Jodie's spent her whole life in the Whit Sunday Islands. She knows all the best snorkel and dive spots, and nobody's better at finding the whales in whale watching season. Which is when? Olivia asked curiously. June to August is the best time. The whales give birth to their calves in the warm waters here. It's a natural nursery for them. We're not allowed to get too close, but sometimes they come close to us. Jodie smiled at her. I've got some amazing photos and video we've taken off the boat. You can have whatever you like for marketing material. That's terrific, Olivia said. Corey had remained at her side, his warm hand resting lightly on the small of her back. He moved away then with a murmured apology to go and greet some more tourists boarding the boat. Olivia barely noticed his departure, focused on her conversation with Jodie. That everyone, Corey? Jody called back after a couple of minutes. Cast off, then, she said when she got a reply in the affirmative. Do you need me to sit down? Olivia asked uncertainly. No, you're fine there. Jody expertly brought the boat's big engines up to a low rev, guiding the boat away from the dock with a deft touch. You two look good together, she said unexpectedly. We only met yesterday, Olivia admitted but I feel like I'm falling head over heels. I've known that boy all his life. Jody was wearing reflective sunglasses, so Olivia couldn't see her eyes, but her tone was friendly. He's one of the few people I've ever met who's just as beautiful on the inside as the outside. Don't you break his heart now. I'll try, Olivia promised, touched by Jody's obvious fondness for Corey. Nobody seemed to have a bad word to say about him, except Jill, who obviously had an axe to grind. It'd be like kicking a puppy. How could you? I've got baggage, though. Maybe too much. Eh, Jody shrugged, gunning the engines as they cleared the small harbour. That's life for you. You'll do fine. You didn't look funny at him when those girls were all over him. That's the one thing Corey wouldn't be able to stand. Rosie warned me about that, Olivia admitted. They were having to speak more loudly to be heard over the engine noise, and she looked towards the back of the boat, hoping Corey wouldn't overhear. He was talking cheerfully to a young couple, though, helping them select snorkelling gear from a cabinet. She told me about Jill. Did she now? Jody said nothing more, though, just concentrated on piloting the boat, and Olivia relaxed and turned her attention to the crystal blue waters they skimmed rapidly across. Hey. Corey came to join her a few minutes later, slipping into the empty seat beside her and putting his arm around her shoulders. Want to come pick out some snorkelling gear? Everyone else has theirs. Sure. 
she followed him to the back of the boat, ignoring the two girls who'd been flirting with Corey and who were now staring at her and whispering to each other. They are no threat to me, she told herself, and believed it. Even knowing Corey as little as she did, she was quite certain the chance of him getting involved with one of the resort's guests was pretty much zero. How long does the boat trip take? She called to Corey over the engine noise, which was even louder at the back of the boat. About twenty minutes, he called back, picking up a set of flippers and holding them close to her feet, nodding that he thought they were about the right size. She chose a mask and snorkel. This'll do. Got sunscreen on? All over. I don't need a burn on my first full day. Damn. She looked a query at him. He laughed, hooked an arm around her waist and pulled her close. I was hoping to be able to offer to help you apply it. Letcher, Olivia accused, laughing back up at him. You're mad if you think I'd pass up a chance to put my hands all over this gorgeous body of yours. He bent his head to bring his lips to hers, but Olivia let him claim only a brief kiss before pulling back. You're working, Corey, and so am I. I want to talk to some of the guests about what they like best about Sunfish Island. Get some idea of what draws people here in the first place. She gave him an apologetic smile, and he let her go with no sign of reluctance. Damn, I love smart women who are right all the time. She gave him a pert smile for that remark before whirling away, snorkeling gear in hand, to go and get started on her job. It would be easy to get carried away in her romance with Corey, but that wasn't why she was here. She was being given a chance to repair her ruined professional reputation, a chance she'd never get anywhere else, and she had no intention of throwing that away. Olivia was sitting and chatting with a friendly middle-aged couple when the engines slowed to a gentle throb. Looking out the window beside her, she saw they had drawn up to a small pontoon, which was obviously moored in place. Corey was standing on it and tied off a rope before he gave Jody a thumbs up and the engines died altogether. The sudden silence was almost overwhelming. Corey and Jody leaped into action, urging everyone off the boat and onto the pontoon, where Corey gave a quick talk about safety, warning everyone not to touch the coral and to stay within sight of the pontoon. We're in a bay with very little current, but if you get into any difficulty, turn over onto your back and raise your hand in the air, and I'll come get you, he concluded. Aren't you coming in, Corey? one of his admirers asked. Afraid not. Jody and I are your lifeguards. We're responsible for every one of you, so we'll be staying right here, watching over you. Now, has everyone got their sunscreen on? Don't want any red lobsters coming back out of this water. There was a general chorus of agreement, then Corey gave them the go-ahead to enter the water. Olivia went in eagerly, keen to see the world-famous reef, although of course she was only seeing a tiny, tiny corner of the World Heritage Site here. Almost instantly, she found herself swimming through a school of tiny, brightly coloured fish darting in and out of the coral. A manta ray lifted up from a patch of sand not far away and flew majestically through the turquoise water, wings sweeping slowly up and down. She saw a new wonder everywhere she looked. She was a strong swimmer, so she had no problem staying under for a good amount of time, blowing bubbles and swimming with long, smooth kicks of her fins to propel herself through the water. It would be easy to lose track of time down here, she thought with a start, when she surfaced to get a few deep breaths, checked the time, and found that almost an hour had passed already. She'd swum quite some distance from the pontoon. Looking back at it, she found Corey peering towards her. He gave her a wave, and she waved back before popping her mouthpiece back in and going face down in the water again, heading back towards the pontoon this time. Enjoying yourself? Corey said with a grin down at her as she surfaced near his feet. This is incredible. Olivia gave him a glowing, happy smile, pulling her mask off. I mean, I've seen pictures, but I always assumed they were the exception, selected highlights, you know, not the norm. But it's just as perfect down there as in every picture I've ever seen. You really have to go diving with Bryce. The outer reefs have even more variety. Corey reached for a large cooler he'd brought from the boat. Want to hop out and have a drink of water? We've got about another half an hour. 
she accepted his offer of a handout and sat on the edge of the pontoon, dangling her feet in the water as she drained the bottle of water he gave her. Hand me the bottle, Corey requested as she finished. Gotta make sure we take all our rubbish back with us. Of course. Going back in? He'd stayed standing beside her, but he wasn't looking at her, his eyes constantly scanning over the water, checking on the other snorkelers instead. He took his job seriously, which Olivia genuinely appreciated. She wouldn't have wanted a man who flirted while he was supposed to be looking out for the safety of others. She went back into the water for another swim, and mainly floated along the surface this time, watching the schools of brightly coloured fish darting among the coral, and thinking that when she went into town to buy a new laptop, she'd have to have a look at waterproof cameras. An Instagram was just one of the ideas she planned to implement for Sunfish, and posting new photos from the reef every day would be a big draw. Chapter 7 On the way back to the resort, everyone was quiet, tired from their exertions. Olivia sat staring vaguely out over the blue water, her mind whirling with plans. She barely noticed when Corey sat down alongside her, but when he casually put his arm around her shoulders, she flinched with sudden pain. Ouch! Startled, he pulled back. Olivia, are you okay? His arm had really hurt when it pressed against her, and now that she was thinking on it, the skin all over her shoulders and back felt sore and tight. Oh my God! I'm such an idiot! He leaned back and looked at her, at the T-shirt she was wearing over her bikini. The white T-shirt, which was drying out now, and was no longer quite as alluringly transparent as it had been earlier. You forgot to put sunscreen on under the t-shirt, didn't you? Forgot that you'd burn through it once it got wet. I'm such an idiot, she said again, tears starting in her eyes. Shush, it's okay. It happens. Look, when we get back, go straight to your cabin and take a cool shower, okay? I'll help Jody clear the boat and I'll come straight over with a bottle of aloe. We'll get you through it. He pressed a light kiss to her brow. Olivia? Corey tapped gently on her screen door. The glass door to the inside of the cabin was open, but the drapes were drawn behind it. Can I come in? Yeah, came the soft reply, and he opened the screen to enter, pushing aside the drapes. She lay face down on the bed, wearing only a pair of cotton bikini panties. Corey sucked in a breath at the state of her back, broken by the white lines where her bikini had covered her. The sunscreen had done its job on the backs of her thighs, and she'd obviously worked it up onto her shoulders as well, but her lower and upper back were an angry red. Oh, honey, you're going to be really sore for a few days. Don't rub it in. She turned her head to the side, resting her cheek on the pillow, and stared at him. Or rather, if that's aloe you've got in that bottle, do rub it in. Lots of it. Certainly is. She was in the middle of the bed, so Corey had plenty of room to sit down on the edge, crack open the bottle, and pour a generous amount of aloe into the middle of her back. This isn't exactly the way I'd hoped to get my hands all over your beautiful body, he teased as he gently smoothed the thick gel over her burned skin. Wasn't what I had in mind either, Olivia griped. But since it feels really good, I'm not complaining. She smiled crookedly up at him, and he couldn't resist leaning down to kiss her. You'll need to do it at least a couple of times a day until I'm all better, too, she added cheekily when he straightened back up, and Corey couldn't help but laugh. God, she was a delight. He'd been attracted to her from the moment he saw her, but in getting to know her, he realised she was so much more than just an admittedly very pretty face. I am your willing slave, he jested, pouring on some more aloe when he saw that her skin had already soaked in the first application. You should really stay here under the air conditioner for tonight at least. Can I get you something to eat? More water? He saw an almost empty water bottle on the nightstand. At least she was drinking. She'd need to. Both, please. I skipped lunch because I was worried about getting seasick and I'm starving, Olivia confessed. No headache? A headache could indicate sunstroke as well as the burn, but she shook her head. Honestly, I feel fine apart from an extremely sore back. He finished smoothing the thick gel into her back, then went into the bathroom to wash his hands. 
I'll be back in a bit with some food. Anything in particular? He recalled that she had a good appetite, having seen her eat lunch yesterday. He wouldn't skimp on the portion. Anything, I'm not fussy. Olivia shrugged and winced as the movement tugged at her sore skin. Could you get me some more water? There's a jug in the fridge in there. She waved a hand vaguely at the door that led into the lounge. Gotcha. Corey picked up the near-empty bottle, headed into the next room, and came face to face with Susanna. She raised her eyebrows, looking past him at Olivia lying face down on her bed in only a pair of panties. Well, you certainly move fast, surfer boy, she drawled, looking amused and highly entertained. It's not like that. She's got a sunburn. Susanna's smirk vanished at once. Merd, on her first day! How did you manage that, Olivia? She pushed past Corey and bent over Olivia with a concerned frown. Oh, that is going to hurt. Already does, but Corey's been generous with the aloe. Olivia gave her roommate a wry smile. My fault. I forgot I'd burned through my T-shirt once it got wet and didn't put sunscreen on my back before I went snorkeling. Corey came back in with the water bottle and set it down on the nightstand. I'm going to go get her some dinner, he said. Are you working tonight, Suze? He suspected he knew the answer. The restaurants were just about to open, and the chef would have already been in action for quite a while if she were on duty. No, Suze shook her head. My night's off. Which is good. I can keep Olivia company and we can get to know each other, yes? In fact... If you are going to be room service waiter, Corey, you could bring me some as well. She grinned at him, and he threw his hands up in surrender, laughing. I shall return. You comfortable? Susanna asked as soon as Corey was gone. Need more aloe? Has it soaked in already? Olivia groaned when Susanna confirmed it had. Yes, please. But just to clarify, I had no problem with Corey being here and rubbing it in for me. Susanna laughed throatily as she picked up the aloe bottle Corey had left behind. Trust me, sugar, I wouldn't have a problem with that hunk of delicious man rubbing his hands all over my naked body either. Olivia couldn't help but giggle at Susanna's remark, delivered in her thick French accent that could have made reciting the telephone directory sound unbearably sensual. Susanna had brought in her laptop, and the two girls lay side by side on the bed, swapping favourite websites, when Corey returned bearing a covered tray. It's amazing what results I get when casually mentioning that this was for you, Susanna, he said, hooking an ankle around a chair and pulling it up to the end of the bed. Why do I have the feeling all your kitchen staff are terrified of you? Because they are, she replied, perfectly unruffled. If a chef's staff are not calling her a tyrant when her back is turned, she is not doing her job properly. Olivia and Corey just looked at each other. You'll never understand, so don't try, Olivia warned. I did some marketing campaigns for restaurants in New York. The chefs are a law unto themselves, and it's pretty much expected. I don't think they live in the same world as the rest of us. We live in the world of good food, Susanna said regally, claiming the bags Corey had brought with him and opening them, sniffing inside each and wrinkling her nose. Let us see what offerings my followers believe are fit for consumption tonight. Corey tactfully headed into the lounge while Olivia sat up and pulled on a loose shirt. He returned with plates and cutlery, dragging the table over to the end of the bed so Susanna could lay out the food on it. She sent him back to collect soda from the fridge and he grinned at her. I can do better than that. I've got beer at my place. Fetch, Susanna flipped her hand at him. Olivia giggled as Corey trotted off to do Susanna's bidding. You are so bossy. Does everyone just ask how high when you say jump? Why would they not? Susanna arched her brows curiously. Wow, I admire your confidence. Do you have a boyfriend? No, I intimidate a lot of men. Susanna gave a very Gallic shrug. But if a man is intimidated by me then he is not man enough for me anyway. I'd prefer no man at all than a weak one. She slid a plate over to Olivia. Here, tell me what you think of these. Corey returned with a six-pack of cold beers, 
setting one down in front of each of the two girls and twisting the tops off. Would you like a glass? he checked with Olivia, suddenly wondering if she would think they were uncultured for drinking directly from the bottle. No, it's fine. She smiled up at him, picked up the bottle and took a long sip. Olivia couldn't remember the last time she'd had such an enjoyable evening. The food Susanna's staff had sent her was absolutely amazing, the beer ice cold and the company excellent. They must have been making enough noise to sound like quite a party because Rosie soon tapped on the screen door and came in to join them. Bryce, the dive instructor, followed not long after, though Corey promptly sent him back out for more beers. I think she's asleep. Olivia roused enough to mutter, No, I'm not, and heard Corey's quiet laugh. Yes, you are, Angel. Shh, I've kicked everyone out. Let's get that shirt off and I'll put some more aloe on your back before you sleep. I can do that, Susanna's accented voice said, but Olivia waved her off, sitting up to fumble at her shirt buttons. No offence, but I like Corey's hands on me better. Susanna laughed, nudging Corey. All right, but you, keep those hands on the burned pads only, hmm? Scouts honour, he promised. Do you even have Boy Scouts here in Australia? She was maybe a little bit drunk, Olivia realised, as her words slightly slurred. She'd only had three beers, but that was a lot more than she usually drank these days. In her time at the centre of the social whirl of New York, she'd probably had a much higher alcohol tolerance. Yes, we do. Need the bathroom? Come on, those teeth want scrubbing. Corey helped her up and into the bathroom, going back out to give her privacy but not quite closing the door, insisting she keep talking to him. When she came back out and gave him a grumpy look, he even managed to keep his eyes on her face and not her exposed breasts, as he led her back to bed and helped her get comfortable on her stomach. You're such a sweet guy. Olivia mumbled as he poured more aloe on her back and smoothed it in gently. I'll be honest and say that my thoughts are not at all sweet at the moment. He lightly stroked the two dimples on either side of the base of her spine. And that if you weren't so badly burned, me giving you a back massage would be a prelude to something other than sleep. Olivia smiled into her pillow. Can I get a rain check on that? Any time. She felt a gentle kiss on her nape, then Corey drew the sheet gently up over her. Get some sleep, Olivia, and stay out of the sun tomorrow. Stay, she said impulsively as his weight lifted off the bed. Hmm? Would you stay and just sleep here? You sure? Yes, please. Give me five minutes. He left her alone, but was back in less than the time he'd promised breath smelling freshly of toothpaste. Wearing a t-shirt and boxers, he slid into bed beside her. This okay? Cheek turned towards him on the pillow. Olivia gave him a sleepy smile. Perfect. Sleep well then, Angel. He leaned over to kiss her lips gently before turning out the light. Chapter 8 Olivia woke with a sore, stinging back and an exceptionally comfortable front. At some point during the night, she'd apparently migrated completely atop Corey and now lay with her cheek on his chest, head tucked under his chin, breasts pressed against his rock-hard abs, their legs tangled together. It could scarcely be a more intimate position. Corey was still asleep, his broad chest rising and falling slowly. It was a comforting rhythm, and if Olivia hadn't been so sore, she'd probably have been soothed straight back to sleep. As it was, one of his broad hands was splayed across the small of her back, and she felt hot and sweaty. Edging carefully off him, she headed for the bathroom. What time is it? Corey mumbled sleepily as she returned. Almost six, she replied quietly, checking her watch. Ugh, I gotta get up. I'm taking a group on a rainforest hike. He sat up, eyeing her appreciatively in the early morning light filtering past the blinds. Olivia smirked at him as she sat on the edge of the bed, making no effort to cover her bare breasts. Getting a good view there. Magnificent, he breathed, eyes riveted as she deliberately took a few deep breaths. Giving himself a shake, he reached to the nightstand. 
but I know the back view won't be pretty. Down on your face, Angel. She lay down without a word, extremely keen to get another soothing layer of aloe on her back. The skin felt hot and tight. She hadn't gotten much of a glimpse in the dimly lit bathroom when she peered over her shoulder at herself in the mirror, but enough to know that her back was practically glowing. You should really stay here and rest today, Corey said, generously slathering the aloe over her back. I'll get someone to bring you some breakfast and check in on you through the day. I've got a really busy one scheduled, unfortunately. I'll get some more aloe for you, too. I don't want to be a bother, and really I should get up. You should absolutely not. I saw Luke last night when I was fetching dinner and told him you'd got a nasty burn. If he sees you around the resort today, he'll be ordering your ass back to bed, so you may as well stay here. I'll go mad with boredom, Olivia protested mutinously. No, you won't, because Sue's left you her laptop. Corey gestured to where it sat on the desk. She'll have it connected to the resort staff Wi-Fi too, so you can binge on Netflix all you like. Netflix and chill? Olivia gave him a wicked grin as he moved away, heading for the bathroom to wash his hands. In the most literal use of the term, yeah. He grinned over his shoulder at her, so she knew he was aware of the colloquial meaning. But when you're better, I would love to Netflix and chill with you. Corey dropped a kiss on her cheek and smoothed her hair before departing. Try and get some more sleep, he said, before closing the screen door quietly behind him. Feeling wide awake, Olivia thought she wouldn't go back to sleep, but she must have dozed off, because the next thing she knew, there was a quiet tapping on the screen door. Olivia, you awake? Uh-huh, she managed vaguely. It was a woman's voice, so she didn't worry about pulling a sheet over her, though she wished she had when the door slid open and Jill came in. Hey, Jill set a tray down on the desk. How are you doing? Oh, wow, that is some burn. Corey wasn't exaggerating. Her back felt sore again, too much so to hold on to her pride. Would you put some more aloe on for me? Olivia begged pathetically. Of course. Corey told me to bring more. Jill held up a fresh bottle. Her expression looked genuinely sympathetic, Olivia thought. I'm sorry. Did her words have more than one meaning? She sounded contrite rather than just sympathetic. What for? Olivia asked as Jill squirted a fresh glob of aloe onto her back. I've been a bitch and you didn't deserve it. Olivia lay silent for a moment before saying, I feel like someone's read you the riot act. Was it Corey? Rosie, actually. She said you were really nice and it's none of my business who Corey wants to date. Which is absolutely true. Jill's hands stilled on her back. He's not really a player if you hadn't figured it out yet. I was pretty sure. Yeah, it's pretty obvious. Jill sighed and got up, going to wash her hands. I'm not really still in love with him, she said, returning and sitting at the desk, reaching to put the tray beside Olivia on the bed. I was just jealous that he's finally moving on. He hadn't so much as looked at anyone in ages. Olivia said nothing, just picked up the sealed cup of orange juice on the tray and opened it. The tray held a covered plate that contained a still warm croissant and a flaky danish, a little pat of butter on one side. I don't suppose your olive branch extends to making me a coffee, does it? She asked hopefully. Jill's worried expression eased and she laughed. Of course it does, she said warmly. I think I owe you a few, to be frank. How do you like it? Well, my regular barista back on the corner of Madison Avenue and East 32nd Street used to make me an amazing cinnamon vanilla macchiato, Olivia said, and couldn't hold in her laughter at Jill's horrified expression. Milk and no sugar will be perfect. Jill giggled too as she went to put the kettle on. For a moment there I thought I was getting belted in the face with that olive branch. Olivia quickly discovered that she liked Jill a lot. The other girl was sharply witty and great fun to be around when her jealousy wasn't eating her alive. Jill shyly asked if Olivia would like some company as she didn't have anywhere to be that morning. Later she mentioned she was working late that day as she was taking the boat into Airlie Beach, 
to collect a large group that was arriving at the mainland airport in the early evening. I want to go. Olivia desperately needed to go clothes shopping and to replace the electronics that had been drowned in her fall off the boat. Corey said you should stay here. Are you serious? Corey is definitely not the boss of me. I'll be fine. I'll cover every inch of skin, I promise, and I'll stick to you like glue so I don't get lost. Jill snickered. I suppose I could show you the good shops. Some of them are a bit too touristy and expensive. The boat goes in earlier to deliver the departing tourists to the airport, so we could have a good couple hours before we need to collect the new arrivals. Sounds like a plan. What time do we have to leave? Jill still took a bit of persuading, but Olivia eventually convinced her that she would go mad if she had to stay in bed all day. She found a button-down denim shirt in the things Rosie had loaned her and put it on without a bra. The straps would have been too painful on her sore skin. Fortunately, she wasn't so well endowed that she'd bounce. A pair of long linen trousers from her own wardrobe, a large sun hat and sunglasses, and Jill pronounced her safe to go outside. Several hours later, tired but content, Olivia was half drowsing when Jill nudged her. Think you might have a small problem. Hmm? She jolted out of her doze, looked where Jill was pointing as the boat came into dock. Oh dear. Corey's height and blonde hair were unmistakable, as was the way he paced up and down the dock. Do you think he's going to be a grump because I didn't obey his orders to stay in bed? Not once he sees that you're perfectly fine, no. Jill grinned at her. I highly recommend grabbing him and sticking your tongue down his throat to cut off any tirade before he gets started, though. Good idea, because I'll probably smack his face if he tries to boss me around. The two girls were fast friends after spending the afternoon together. Jill had kept her word to show Olivia the shops and helped to carry the bags full of her purchases back to the boat before they headed for the airport, and in turn, Olivia had helped Jill corral the arriving guests and get them all organised. Corey seemed to be struggling with himself as he watched Olivia disembark laden with shopping bags. She walked towards him a little hesitantly, offered up a small smile. Shopping? Really? he said resignedly. You did witness all my electronics getting drowned. She waved the bag containing her new laptop, tablet and mobile phone at him. Plus, I really needed some sunfish-appropriate clothing. Can't be wearing Rosie's stuff all the time. He sighed, and to his credit said not one word about her promise to stay in her room. Which, technically, she hadn't actually given, Olivia thought virtuously. Instead, he just held out his hands. Can I carry those for you? Olivia beamed at him and unloaded the heavier bags from her hall. You earn lots of brownie points for that, you realise. I was hoping. Is there a reward? Corey smiled at last. There could be, she gave him a coquettish look. But it'll have to be delivered in private. Corey walked very quickly, long legs eating up the ground as he headed purposefully back to the staff accommodation area. Laughing her ass off, Olivia followed. By the time she caught up, he was unpacking her electronics purchases onto her desk. Figured I'd save you some time. Now, about that reward. Well, she deposited her own bags on the chair. You get to put your hands all over me again. How's that back? He came over to gently ease her shirt off her shoulders as she unfastened the buttons, hissing softly between his teeth as he saw her back. Still red as hell, but it does look a bit better, I think. I want a shower. Want to come in and wash my back? She cast him a coquettish look over her shoulder. Catching her waist in his hands, Corey pressed a kiss to her shoulder before seeking her lips. Afterwards, Olivia lay on Corey's chest, listening to the thump of his heartbeat below her ear as it steadied back to a normal rhythm. His hands lay loosely on her upper thighs. Even in the throes of orgasm, he hadn't touched her sore back and her heart swelled with affection for him, for his consideration and his gentleness. When she'd fled New York with her tail metaphorically between her legs, she'd hoped for merely somewhere safe and quiet to lick her wounds, far from the glare of the spotlight and the tattered remains of her career. 
She'd never thought for a moment that she might be lucky enough to find friends like Rosie, Susanna and Jill, never dared to dream she might find a man like Corey, who was willing to take a chance on a relationship with her, even knowing everything about her past. Lying there listening to Corey's breathing slow as he drifted towards sleep, Olivia knew a contentment she'd never before experienced. Here on the far side of the world, on a tropical island far removed from where she'd ever expected she might end up, she'd finally found home. Letting her eyes close, Olivia let herself drift off to sleep, held securely in Corey's arms. Whatever the future might hold for the two of them, and she hoped that it held a great deal, she knew that no matter what, she would always have a place with her friends on Sunfish Island. The End You have been listening to Finding Corey, book one in the Island Escapes series, by Caitlin Lynch. Narrated by Catherine Bilson. Copyright 2018. Audiobook Production Copyright 2020. The next book in this series is The Reluctant Billionaire, book two. For more works by Caitlin Lynch, please visit my website at caitlinlynch.com.